We're going to talk to the son of the actual man who ran Project Blue Book for the Air Force. What did they really find out after all those years? Well, you've probably seen the groundbreaking series Project Blue Book on the History Channel. We're going to hear it directly from Paul Hynek, whose father was Alan J. Hynek, the man behind Project Blue Book. Carrie Harrison with you. And, well, America is a place uh, that has lots of reported instances of abductions. We've had UFO sightings over the years. Most people on the planet uh, tend to believe that there must, there must be life out there somewhere. We just recently got to see the uh, ultimate solar anus, that being the first view of a black hole ever. Einstein was right, it turns out. Uh, he being right, also he suggested that there would, uh, along with Stephen Hawking, likely be life somewhere else, given the size and volume of of the endless and expanding universe. With that, I want to introduce to you Paul Hynek. Paul is the son of Alan Hynek. If you remember the name, and most of us have heard of Project Blue Book, this was an operation run by the United States Air Force in the 1950s to investigate UFOs, or really debunk them, on behalf of the Air Force. Well, this is the son now, the surviving son of Alan Hynek, Paul Hynek, who himself has become quite the expert. And Paul, I want to thank you so much for showing up for the rest of us, especially with the discovery of the black hole and the notion that there is greater life outside than just here. Well, living in Los Angeles, I hear all the time that there's great life outside where I am. <laughs> and that's kind of a joke, but yes, it's true. Yeah, so I'm delighted to be here. And it is really exciting to have seen that the first photo of a black hole. That was amazing. Well, especially when so many people and so much resource uh, we have. What is it up in Berkeley? I forget the computer programs where people's computers all over the world are linked together to analyze and constantly crunch data from signals being sent to outer space, uh, uh, radiographical type things. All of this goes on. It's real. Like, a lot of resources are put out for this, and now we have proof positive of one of the very plot stories of every Star Trek episode, a black hole. That's right. And, you know, black holes, we don't have very much understanding of their properties, and yet that's still considered part of light energy and light matter, and dark energy and dark matter, about which we haven't the faintest idea comprises about 96% of the known universe. We're talking right now to Paul Hynek. He is the son of Dr. Alan Hynek, who was the principal investigator in Project Blue Book, carried on by the Air Force in the 1950s to explore UFOs and pretty much debunk them. But your father, who started as a skeptic, Paul, uh, didn't end up as one, did he? Uh, no, that's right. And people like to say that he went from a a skeptic to a believer, but I think a better word for a scientist would be an acceptor, because it's not really a question of belief, but of accepting that there is data that warrants attention and a classification system. So he became, he became somebody who accepted the data as leading to a conclusion that there was a real phenomenon there. What it was, or the provenance of the inhabitants of these crafts, that's still to be determined. Now, the History Channel recently ran a series, which means it'll have a forever shelf life on the Internet uh, and certainly rerun and be available on demand on pretty much every streaming service. And it's great quality. Uh, I don't know what your personal opinion is or how uh, accurate you think it is, but it's called Project Blue Book. And it depicts the story of your father uh, early on in the Air Force and then with his own eyes seeing uh, UFOs is... As a child, I imagine you would have heard whispers of this. I know it was classified, uh, but over time, you've investigated this yourself. Yes, and my brother Joel and I serve as consultants on Project Blue Book. So we have input for the scripts. We've come to know the cast and crew quite well. Um, and I think it's a great show. You know, history has really struck a fine balancing act between dramatization and truth. And they've really tried to find the authenticity of my father and my mother. Um, so each show starts off with a real life reported UFO case. And obviously my, my mother and my father. And then it's kind of off to the races in terms of making it more dramatized. 
Um, and at the end of each show, they show information about what was really reported in the case and interviews with my brother and I and others about what my father's real fe real feelings were about those cases. So it's a really good way to use a piece of fiction, which is much more effective at making the tent much larger and welcoming more people into the discussion and then giving them more resources to find out what was actually reported. You know, it's interesting, Paul Hynek. Uh, we think, well, why isn't this stuff in the New York Times? Because the New York Times would have a big problem with the Air Force, with the, uh, as Eisenhower, that era, by the way, when your father was doing these investigations, talked about the mili military industrial complex. They're not going to let the New York Times run what might be factual data stories on subject matter like this. So we're stuck in many ways, as we have been throughout the years. We have to have dramatizations on Netflix. We have to have theatrical releases of semi-fictional movies to talk about dynamic history. It's the only way we can get away with it. Yeah, and, and that said, about a year and a half ago, there was a blockbuster article in the New York Times about the continuing existence of research efforts in the Pentagon with the ATIP program, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Again, I'm just going to, uh, for people who are, as Dorothy said, the Wizard of Oz, coming and going so quickly here, as we do uh -huh. uh, either streaming or driving in our cars on FM, you are the son of Dr. Alan J. Hynek. He was the principal investigator in famous Project Blue Book which was a full-on government program to explore and investigate UFOs. Uh, they flew all over the country to interview and talk to and often disabuse eyewitnesses of what they had actually seen and convince them they probably saw something else. That's what the Air Force wanted. But your father was uh, running kind of a, a, a double experience, complying with <laughs> the Air Force, but on his own, having his own experience, right? Yeah, you know, you had, uh, especially after 1953 with the Robertson panel, the sort of raison uh, d'etre of Project Blue Book was to tamp down public hysteria uh, and not so much to find craft and reverse engineer extraterrestrial propulsion systems. So at that point, you had an Air Force that just really wanted to find solutions, as the, the TV show really quite clearly demonstrates. They wanted to find solutions or propose solutions for all the reported cases, but that's not what a scientist does. You know, and I've I've recently met the last surviving Air Force director of Project Blue Book, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend, who is 99 years old. And he was a favorite of my father amongst the five or six military directors that he worked with. And in an interview with him, I saw he mentioned that the very first thing that he felt that he had to do from the Air Force point of view was to determine if a case was legitimate. And that's the same thing with a scientist. But then even with somebody as with as much integrity as Robert Friend, the next step would have him veer from where my father would go as a scientist, because being part of the military, his next responsibility was to determine if the case was legitimate, did it then potentially pose a threat to national security? which is not how a scientist thinks. So even with somebody who's simpatico and a, a genuine person, you're gonna have very different uh, paths of inquiry for a scientist and a military person. Paul Hynek, your father, Alan Hynek, was a physicist, I think among many other things. So what did he tell you he actually saw or thought? Again, this is from a, a scientist, not a right. fan, not a Star Trek fan or a Star Wars fan, <laughs> but as, right. a, a, as an intellectual scientist with top access, by the way. So this is not Timmy looking through the window. This is a guy who there is nothing in his way from seeing absolutely everything that is knowable. Well, um, that's a really interesting turn of phrase. Absolutely everything is knowable. I'm not sure that he saw he had access to everything. I don't know if anybody in the government has had access to everything because it's so highly compartmentalized. And you have these sort of turf wars and different fiefdoms, even inside just the Air Force, much less the overall intelligence and military communities. So my father saw a good deal of information, but what he really felt was the most compelling was the sheer weight 
of the combined total of the really good cases, because that's something that's not doctored by the military, interpreted, viewed through their kind of lens. That's just direct reports from people out in the field. And some of the cases, including Air Force pilots, which my father thought were particularly compelling, because how could the Air Force deny reports by their own trained employees? And so my father thought the, the, the real merit was in looking at all the cases, classifying them, and seeing where the chips would fall from an, a rigorous scientific examination of the cases themselves. I would think, Paul Hynek, that one of the most compelling things, exactly to the point of your father, is Air Force pilots, uh, many of whom had never met each other, all having a, a very similar experience. How you have a mass hallucination, it just sort of doesn't really happen. Uh, yeah. Them all hearing songs. like Yeah. Right. With, with Air Force pilots who are highly trained, have very good vision, respond well under pressure, and you have cases where you have multiple Air Force pilots seeing the same thing, and you also have radar corroboration. And then another point as to the motivations of the witness, they have nothing to gain by reporting these sightings, nothing whatsoever, and yet they keep coming in. Now, your personal uh, explorations, experience, uh, research into your father's research, I think you are it's fair to say you're a believer, right? I would say, like my father, I'm an acceptor. So break down what is it you accept so that we can all have, let's just say, a more sober view of okay. the potential out there. Right. So I believe there is definitely something behind the UFO phenomenon, something real and something intelligent. Um, and, and like my father, I don't automatically believe that it's of sort of classical extraterrestrial origin that it's some other beings getting in a craft and coming here with a you know, much better propulsion system than we have now. There are, there are some issues with that, such as it's such a vast distance, you have to tweak Einstein in the nose. And again, Einstein was just verified again yesterday or right. when the photo was made. Um, and we have very sensitive instruments to determine when objects enter and leave our atmosphere We've got a lot of videos of UFOs, but we don't have the corresponding reports of them entering and leaving our atmosphere. Plus, they exhibit a lot of comfort with our Earth, gravity, and environment. So my father, and, and I agree, felt that the traditional extraterrestrial hypothesis had some problems with it. So he started to lean more towards metadimensional and other even perhaps more exotic theories as to their provenance. Um. That was pretty fancy. Break that down for Mildred in Ohio. So probably not aliens from Mars, but perhaps even us from another dimension or us from another time. Hmm. Uh, this, you know, interestingly enough, as we speak, um, I don't know how many shows there are on, again, mentioning Netflix, because they seem to be everybody's everything nowadays. But there are probably five simultaneous shows running about these parallel dimensions and all of that. And they're well written and well thought out. So it doesn't seem so impossible. And this is also in alignment, by the way, with uh, Einstein and Stephen Hawking and many of the other thinkers of how things work and the fluidity of time and the many layers of things. So uh, this is Sorry, actually the, the first time I've heard of this hypothesis, and I'm liking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not a physicist, but the, you know, physicists think there is a multiverse with up to 11 dimensions. And so they could be existing in the same X, Y coordinates of space time uh, without us knowing about them. Rethinking Heroes with Kerry Harrison. RethinkingHeroes.com. You've probably seen the groundbreaking series Project Blue Book on the History Channel. And we are hearing from Paul Hynek, whose father was, in fact, Alan J. Hynek, one of the most famous names in the Air Force because he was the man behind Project Blue Book. Well, Paul Hynek is an adjunct professor of finance and accounting at Pepperdine University, so right here in L.A. He's raised over $1 billion for thousands of startups and was involved in the making of Avatar, Lord of the Rings, Planet of the Apes, Call of Duty, 
and numerous other movies and games. So the interest of his father also allowed him to continue people's appetites and tease them. He's also obviously exquisitely talented in helping people move ahead in great storytelling. Uh, we have spent today really talking about the nature of UFOs, UAPs. We brought on Laura Eisenhower, the great granddaughter of Dwight D. Eisenhower, the president, the one who inherited Project Blue Book and then made it, you know, gave it some hair and teeth and arms and legs and took it to the next step. We learned from Laura Eisenhower how things worked and how even in that administration, they, the president who created these areas to explore and investigate those areas, just as we heard from Paul Hynek, started to give their own offshoots of committees that started to firewall that information from the president himself. So it turns out there were all these other things going on, and here's the President Eisenhower thinking there's just A, B, and C, but it goes all the way up to J, X, Y, and Z. So same thing we're hearing, and we know about compartmentalization. We see it in the Apple Corporation, after all, don't we? It's called siloing, where the guy working on the iPhone has no idea what's happening with the iMac or the Mac Mini. No idea whatsoever. And that way, with these silos and these firewalls, there isn't any cross-pollination of not only ideas, but secrets leaking out. And often it turns out when people discover things, they want credit for them. And the credit doesn't necessarily need to go back to the mothership. Maybe there's personal gain. We find that has happened throughout history as well. So one of the great values and virtues, in my view, of science fiction is it is a doorway for us to ask deeper questions. If we just get geopolitical all the time and ask direct political questions, we get the runaround, we get the workaround, we get the sidestep, we get the hand in the face. But if you do it through fantasy and science fiction, you do it through analogies, you do it through metaphors, you can actually often get to the truth. So that was the value of today's show. Take what you like, leave the rest. I know there was so much material, it's almost impossible to absorb. But if your mind is even slightly open, if you believe in gravity, if you believe in quantum physics, quantum theory, which you cannot dispute anymore, we've now actually seen black holes, all of this stuff is real, um, then you'll know there's more out there than meet the eye. So we'll do what we can to bring in those who know what they know. And we've talked to two top people today from the top levels of the beginning of everything. And uh, I hope it was fun for you as it was for me. I want to wish everyone a wonderful weekend. And I so look forward to seeing you next week. Don't forget, you can go to uh, rethinkingheroes.com, rethinkingheroes.com, and you're going to be able to see videos of a bunch of our past shows, full videos, uh, and all the rest of it, and kind of see what we do all the time and how we help people, because that's my mission, for better or for worse, is to help people, uh, authors, thinkers, people that are trying to get information out, especially during a time of constipation and compression where you get banged all the time. I go on YouTube, I get strikes. I go on TikTok, I get strikes. Why? Because I just mentioned basic things that really apparently we're not supposed to do. Yet oddly on radio with FCC, we can. It's shocking. Analog radio still has no bandwidth restrictions and it still has no firewalls, what you can say. So this is definitely your home base. It's my home base. I love you guys a lot, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Rethinking Heroes with Kerry Harrison. RethinkingHeroes.com Are you juggling multiple tools to run your online business? Well, thankfully, there's a better way, and it's called Kartra. K-A-R-T-R-A. -R -R with Kartra, boosting your income has never been easier. That's because it's the ultimate all-in-one platform for online success, offering every tool you need to grow. Imagine building pages, funnels, courses, autoresponders, and checkouts all in one place for one affordable price. And the best part about Kartra is that you can automate anything. So it's like having a team of experts working around the clock to help you earn more. Ready to streamline and scale? Well, visit RethinkingHeroes.com slash money for a free 30-day trial. That's RethinkingHeroes.com slash money for a free 30-day trial.